Following on from the previous section, I'm going to quote the last two chapters of the book, with a few additions in the case of chapter 19, before we go on a little further, to bring this matter completely up to date. Chapter 19 When I write about the failings and crimes of certain countries, it is of course governments and their establishments that I refer to, and not the people, the powerless majority of every nation. The last main issue that I want to address is one of the most important to myself, and I am going to relate it to my own country, which is Great Britain, but I think it also has resonance in most other countries. This section I felt I had to write, if things are going to get bad over the next however many years, chances are society will be ready at some point to take one of the biggest steps in centuries. Going into the future, I believe that our own apathy, ignorance and our government is the greatest threat that people face. Writing my BA dissertation and working on another module led me to ask questions of our own political system, which is really not very democratic, but it doesn't stop there, and we're constantly sold lies and deceived by those in power. This led me to the conclusion that we have an outdated democratic system which, with its collaboration with corporations and private investors, benefits the few at cost to the masses. We've given power to politicians who care more about that power and themselves than they do the ordinary people and our planet. This is why corporate earnings have gone through the roof while wages and salaries for the hardest working and the poorest have remained virtually stagnant. This is why there is no real progress on saving the environment. My own questions about the nature of our democratic system led me to the idea of direct democracy. It was a natural conclusion. Our present system, and that of most democracies, is from a time when it would have taken a week or more to cross the country. Now information passes in moments. Almost every strand of our lives has been altered except for our democratic process. One of the lessons I personally drew from Orwell is that we get what we deserve with regards to our form or type of government. That's the danger of apathy. I am not content with telling any children I may have that I find our present form of government unacceptable, and yet did nothing. There are a number of political parties in the UK that claim to stand for direct democracy, but my search led me to the People's Administration Party, which was established by Alex Romain, a musician by profession. There are no MPs standing for PA, because it requires none. It is up to us to make the decisions if ever enough votes are gathered, which would begin with a discussion period as to how best to achieve it. This is the type of democracy that Orwell was bewitched by in Barcelona. Even the military corps of the alliance were without officers, but the people made it work, and he fell in love with its ideals. This form of direct democracy has been successfully tried and tested, albeit on a smaller scale. I never thought I'd be promoting an online political movement, but in this movement, it really is us that will make the decisions. I recommend checking the PA website for latest developments. Yes, there are a lot of issues relating to the establishment of this system, or one based on this ideology, but there are challenges for which the solutions exist. It will remove completely the top level of government, we can keep our MPs for the purpose of debate if we want or not, but they'd answer directly to and for us. It can be operated on a local and national level, and even if only a small percentage of the populace actually engage in this new democratic process, then it will still have more input than is presently possible, and decisions will not be blighted by friendships, personal wealth or possible career prospects. It will turn a parliament of a few to a congress of millions. Political corruption will be stemmed as power will rest in the hands of the general population, the anonymous many. If you want your child to be a slave to the system that's being established around us, do nothing. That's not an option for myself, as I consider the way we are governed, and the increase in wealth hoarded by the few, and the threat posed to the environment, often to protect and enhance that wealth, to be among the biggest challenges our society faces. Government will never act in a way or make changes that will harm themselves or their corporate friends, and an economy that serves all requires the distribution of wealth to function fairly, not the hoarding of it. If we do nothing to alter the way we are governed, we condemn ourselves, our children, and theirs to come to this repeated cycle of boom, bust and war, with not so much boom, I think, whilst the rich get richer, the masses for which any fully functioning democracy should serve 
are destined to get ever poorer. Due to the hoarding of the very wealth they generate and more powerless due to our continued tolerance of an inadequate, failing, democratic system. This issue is one that I feel very passionate about and it is one that our government in the UK fears greatly, which is why you will never see anything about the People's Administration or direct democracy in any of the national newspapers or on any of the main media news channels. More recently, Alex has released his patent for quantum perpetual motion power generators for the world to use free, one for the car, house and work. These are not in any way complex and they provide free electricity without any byproducts or waste of any kind. There are cars already driving around using similar tech and it's so good there's no interest. It sounds too good to be true, but it's amazing how energy can be created by self-sustaining microbes that create, emit and consume electrons while requiring no light, oxygen or food. And it makes all other forms of power generation seem antiquated. We're talking about simple safe chemicals such as lemon juice and other household products. I would strongly recommend watching the video on People's Administration Party website at papparty.co.uk or do a search on YouTube for Alex Remain and Quantum Perpetual Motion. He's getting 10 volts from a perpetual power pack half the size of a cigarette packet. These can be upsized and can operate in series, but don't expect to see them for sale anytime soon. If this works, and I trust Alex to know what he's doing, then it's energy freedom we're talking about. Free, portable and non-polluting. This is one freedom they are not going to give us. We're going to have to fight for it or make it ourselves. I've got a lot of trust in Alex Romain. He's not a crank. If this works, it's the energy source for the present, not the future. Easy to create, no waste, portable and free. Full utilisation of such an energy source would have serious global implications on almost every level, but it would also enhance our quality of life and the chances for the environment immensely. In opposition, many will no doubt say that this technology is a long way away. That's a lie. They just won't want us to have it. That's a betrayal. Nano Flow Cell has been utilising similar technology for over a decade and have created some beautiful, reliable, fast cars that only need a water-based electrolyte and power up to 300 kilometres an hour on 48 watts per wheel. No batteries required. I met Alex Romain a number of years ago and he is one clever guy that does things for the right reasons. It was he that supplied the FBI with the software enabling them to catch thousands of paedophiles many years ago. He had offered it to the UK government for free, but they declined his offer, just as they did his software to weed out online bullies. I've got a lot of respect for him and his work, and I hope the time comes when he receives the recognition and credit he deserves, rather than having to live off the grid for his own safety. But then, Countries have been attacked, their leaders murdered and their infrastructure destroyed for posing less of a threat to the present status quo. The impact of quantum perpetual motion power generation on corporations, governments and individuals involved in carbon fuel extraction and energy supply would be immense. But investments into so-called green energies such as wind farms would also become redundant, costing trillions in lost investments. That's too much of a cost for them. But we all know, something must change. Life, the world, is about to. It's time for us to grow up as a race. That or perish. If we can't live prosperously and considerately with our own planet and ourselves, how can we be entrusted with other planets? If you really want to do something for the kids, then give them a future that doesn't start in some distant dream. We all know that things are not working at the moment. Globally, for the planet, for the vast majority of us, the running of our society should not be the issue of others, but a concern of all, and our education system needs to reflect this. But state schools here in the UK are starved of cash, which must ultimately impact on performance and expectations, while in tax-free Eton, Harrow, Charterhouse and many other private public schools, we are ingrained with a sense of entitlement that derives from the notion that we are incapable of ruling ourselves. Another aspect of ourselves I think we need to consider across the world, which is the tendency we have as individuals towards our own national identity. It's natural, I know, I feel it myself, 
but nationalism creates divisions in what will be our global family, which is how we need to regard ourselves if humanity is to reach its full potential as we move forward. Nationalism is a powerful force. It usually invokes an emotional response. It draws on our national identity, and often we look to our past, our ancestors, to help shape that response. Times of conflict or oppression are often drawn upon for the sacrifices made and will gauge our responses accordingly, often on Facebook, but sometimes with a homemade shotgun against an unarmed, hard-working civil servant. We need to send future generations a unified response that will embolden and sustain them, strength through unity and love. We're all family, but presently too many governments think it's okay to make war or drop bombs on members of our family as long as there's profit in it, and especially if there's no one to report it. Just as they think it's okay to push our environment beyond the brink, it's ours, and we have an obligation to act for it when we genuinely believe it's being abused. Balance is the key. I might have related much of this to my own country, but it must be applicable all over the world, globally. Pipe dream? Maybe. But I'm not talking about destroying societies to rebuild them. After I published the sixth revision, I had one question. What about China? Powerful, non-democratic, atheist government that isn't about to give up power or even change course easily. The response, I felt, don't worry about it. When I first started working on this channel in the summer, I asked again. I was a bit more concerned, as this is a big commitment to make. What about China? Less than two days later, it rained there apocalyptic rain. That was good enough for me under the circumstances. If what I've been through with regards to this book is all just one very long string of unconnected coincidences with a physical impossibility thrown in for laughs, then societies will struggle on as best they can. But if this is all for a greater purpose, which I personally lean towards, I think I'm writing this sort of stuff for a reason. I have no idea what to expect. But if we're talking about global social change, it will likely be to rebuild, because our societies may break down, fracture or collapse under the strain of what's to come. Chapter 20 A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny, and see thou hurt not for the oil and for wine. I laughed when I first read that in Revelation many years ago. Not a sniggering laugh, an understanding one, as I softly spoke the words, of course not. It meant to myself that I could say what I wanted about institutions, governments, corporations, but certain things were not to be harmed. The oil symbolised remembrance to myself, the commemoration of those that have gone before, from the time my grandmother used to keep an oil wick burning in a cupboard with religious icons and a picture of my grandfather. While the wine symbolised communion, the love and faithful of all persuasions, would have held out for so long, regardless of religion or creed. I guess you could describe it as maintaining the loyalty to love. As I come towards the culmination of my journey, and with the added insight gained along the way, I was left with one question. What of the angels? I know what you might be thinking. But after all my theories about how and why I was led to this place, I realised that I couldn't disregard them. Any belief that I may have in angels are as a consequence of an experience that I had on my last trip to Thailand. It was only after I knew of the final destination to this book that I gave the experience greater credence. There was a woman I bumped into a number of times whilst on the island of Koh Phang Yang on which I was staying. Occasionally, I would see her in the queue for the cash point at the main port town. Once or twice, I stood by her, sheltered along the wall of the bank, taking advantage of the meagre shade it offered from the scorching sun. We'd exchange pleasantries and chat a little. She is attractive, but not so much in a sexual way. She had a very kind-looking face, almost angelic, probably early thirties, bright blue eyes, a wild mop of blonde hair, and a peaceful smile. You never felt like you had to talk to her to be comfortable in her presence. I remember seeing her once on the ferry to Koh Samui. We exchanged pleasantries on passing, as we had before. But I was travelling with a German friend, and 
though we spent much of the time engaged in conversation, I couldn't help but look over at her, noticing how peaceful she looked, taking in the morning sun, holding her straw hat over her head, eyes closed, and that serene smile. Holidays, as they must, come to an end. It didn't seem like long before I was in the backpackers' district of Bangkok, on the Khao San Road, along with two friends, reacclimatizing ourselves to civilization before our relative flights home. We were in one of the many restaurants that served the area. It was a large corner place at the southern end of the road, open spaced, with plenty of free tables, where we settled before I went off to see if I could score some marijuana at one of the local sources I knew of, where I was told to come back in 20 minutes. But on returning to my friends, just after crossing the road and slipping behind the market sellers that then lined the street, one stepped back and quickly said, Don't go back, police. I nodded my appreciation and without stopping gave her my thanks and took her advice. But on the way back to my friends, sat in the opposite side of the same restaurant, was the lady I described, sitting alone at the table, but looking very anxious and perplexed. Her eyes were exploring the room from one side to the other, a confused look on her face that seemed to border on fear. This was not the serene, tranquil person that I was used to seeing. And, as I was passing her anyway, I said hello and sat down opposite. Is everything okay? I asked, concerned. She nodded, but she knew I could see it wasn't. I waited for a verbal response. I could see she was thinking about what to say as she bit her bottom lip gently. She seemed relieved by her decision to tell me, and, leaning forward in a hushed voice, informed me, I can see angels. Not the response I was expecting, but I knew it was a serious matter to her, and I wanted to know more. When you say angels, you mean like people with wings? I asked curiously. Yes, she replied, before going on to confirm to me their appearance, and to tell me that ever since she'd been a young child, she'd seen them in ones and twos, just on occasions, but often enough, which left me a little confused. So what's the problem? I asked sensitively. Her eyes scanned the room as she leant forward a little further and slowly said, the restaurant is full of them. I've never seen so many all at one time, as she peered around the room. Obviously, I couldn't see a thing other than my friends sitting across the other side and the staff, the place looked empty, but I knew she wasn't lying. Now I had to confirm what she meant, and she told me that they were standing all around the restaurant, lots of them, just doing nothing but looking on. We both agreed that in the world where one sees angels, albeit usually in their ones and twos, this would appear extremely unusual. As for myself, I may have found it difficult to engage in too deep a conversation about something I couldn't actually see, so we were soon talking about our trips, how they'd gone, and where we were going. I discovered her home was in Melbourne, and this was pretty much an annual event for her. Thailand, that is. As I rose to leave, she looked up at me, and said a heartfelt, Thank you. What for? I asked. For listening to me like you did. For believing me. I was touched as I realised just how much our conversation had meant to her. I smiled and told her, If you tell me you can see angels, who am I to say otherwise? She wasn't lying. I knew that much for sure. In later years I couldn't help but think that maybe, just maybe, there were so many as they were watching me and even helping at times. If I had been arrested scoring marijuana, I was so sick I would most likely not have survived and this book would never have been written. I kind of like the thought that there's been angels there all the time, watching over me, especially at my times of suffering. As absurd as the idea might seem to some, writing that paragraph felt so right. So how do I fit angels into the equation if I don't believe in a heaven in which we all dwell? I think there is a kind of heaven, but not a place where we as individuals dwell. Not a place of being, but a state of being, when we're completely at one again with universal consciousness. Perhaps we initially had a choice, being part of a physical world as we know it, or being a guide, an angel as we call them, which, protected from the pain and the inequalities of physical life, as well as its pleasures, remains pure.
and perhaps soon they'll be busy. With regards to the apocalyptic aspect of this book, whether you believe or not is up to you. I'm certainly not here to convert anyone. But in a world that I find holds so little worth believing in and so much uncertainty, I have found something for which I'd rather die being taunted a fool than ever deny. The whole experience of writing this book and living the life that has come with it has enriched me in ways that I'd never thought possible. It may well have caused me many difficulties, like any great adventure, but it has been an experience that, for myself, compares with the greatest journeys. But I find it difficult to be someone I'm not. I'm not a preacher or a preaching type. Your soul, your consciousness, is your concern. As I wrote, I take nothing back. Ultimately, I found myself on a journey which I share with you, and I felt obliged to share my thoughts with regards to what I think this might signify and other matters. But you, the reader, will have to determine for yourself what you wish to take from what I've written, if anything. When I sat on the beach in Thailand, wishing nature would free this planet from humanity, I did consider that it might be nice if a few continued. A small number of us that survived, I realised though, that even if something apocalyptic happened and our numbers greatly diminished, we would still repeat ourselves, as there would be a few amongst us not content with life itself, with a need for power and control which would inevitably impact us all. So I thought it better we all went, as I never believed that there was a force capable of that kind of selection for a future race. Our planet came first. That's changed somewhat. My medical consultant told me that miracles aside, they had no medical explanation as to how I survived full-blown AIDS for so long, along with two attacks of the MAI infection. If I took a test today, it would return negative due to the efficiency of modern medicines. How quickly things change, and how easily we forget. But I remember laying on what many, myself included, thought would be my deathbed, covered in blood riddled with pain, and ready to go. Last thing I want when that day comes again, however it comes, is to search my heart and find regret, especially in relation to this journey. I am going to leave you with a past experience that had a very powerful effect on myself, and also, by coincidence, perhaps, has a connection with a certain section of revelation, and so too, this journey. One night, when I was in my early teens, I went to bed and had this experience which would haunt me for many years. By this point in my life, I'd come to regard emotions as being of the greatest importance. Before this night, I'd started using my emotions to remember very early memories. Just snippets, but so early I wouldn't want to tell people. I found it exciting. I felt like I could use my feelings to lead me places. And this particular night, I went to bed and decided I would feel for the feeling of death. My thinking at the time was that it would be the same feeling that came before birth. And if there was an existence before and after this life, I might experience a taste of it. I switched off the bedroom light and got myself comfortable and relaxed in bed. I closed my eyes and tried to consciously take my mind to a state of total inactivity while staying aware. Soon after I started to feel somewhat detached, as, at first slowly, and very unexpectedly, I could feel myself slipping, which is the only way I can describe it. It was so strange, this was not a dream, I was conscious and awake, but I slipped further and further until very quickly reaching that moment of horror when I'd be falling, falling into an abyss, a black bottomless abyss. I leapt from my bed and run for the light. It wasn't enough. I rushed downstairs in my pyjamas in a state of panic, switching on lights as I went, before going into the lounge and turning on the radio. There was no 24-hour TV back then, and a record wouldn't have been good enough. I had to hear the voice of someone that was living. I needed confirmation of life. I was terrified. On a number of occasions, over the years, after that night, as I relaxed, ready for sleep, I would recall that feeling with the same result and leap out of bed in a horrible panic 
and sit downstairs trembling with fear for a time, listening to whatever live, human voices I could find on the radio, until I'd calmed down enough to go back to bed. It was a big concern of mine when I was diagnosed as being HIV positive. How would I react for next time? I dreaded the thought of it. I expected it to be so much worse. More horrifying for my predicament. But it never returned. That feeling. That awful, terrible feeling. That feeling of death. I don't fear passing. But that idea of death, I am not ashamed to admit, scares me. Most people would celebrate completing their first book. I did when I first finished writing chapter 14. I even rewarded myself, though I was questioning the strange experiences that I'd been through, and the footprints which I was extremely curious about. But when I finished chapter 15, I went to my bed, curled up like a baby, and cried. I wet my heart out, and lay sobbing until I slept. It was the first time I'd cried myself to sleep since I was a child. Either a force has been at work, humouring me, personally, in a way that I find very hard to believe, or something has happened, is happening, that also affects you. I was crying for humanity. That first appeared within the pages of the 16th chapter of the second revision, but I am about to commit further as this journey reaches beyond the printed sixth revision and is finally brought to some form of a conclusion. There are still some surprises to come, even for myself. Before then, I want to say a few words aside. I intend to keep these videos advertisement free and I have a donation button here on YouTube to assist with this. I will add more to this channel if there's a requirement. As long as I'm here, I'm here. I will not shirk any responsibilities that I feel derived from this matter. This journey, thus far, could not have happened without the support of the British people through their health benefit system. That deserves some recognition. I've been grateful, and it would be nice for me to move on. Now, let us move on. This is the second recording of this section. I thought the first half-hearted, and I have to commit. I have to put my whole heart into this, with the confidence of my faith. When I returned from Cyprus, after giving books out in December 1999, I went through a process that for me, in the past, has signified a desire to move on. I cleaned out. Mostly everything except for bits and pieces I kept in a box, letters and some books. I hadn't moved into my new home at that point, so it just left the car. I cleared the glove box, picking through the bits one by one. At the very bottom, lying in the dark, was a book. It lay front cover down. I picked it up and read the back cover, recognising it as Richard Bach's Illusions. And, as I slowly turned it over, I was met with the words of a subtitle, The Adventures of a Reluctant Messiah. I felt like I was being played with. I have this relationship with fate, and I'm smiling. It took time to grasp. It's been a wonderful adventure. I give thanks. I'm ready. The sixth revision was published on the 4th of May 2020, although early drafts date back to September 2019. I had planned to start a master's degree in January 2020, but I decided to bring it forward to September 2019, and a few weeks before term started, I submitted my application for MA Publishing, as I understood it had a wide brief for the final project, and work related was on the list, and I was thinking this work. But I was declined publishing and told that creative writing stroke publishing might be more acceptable, which I agreed. But I was a little disgruntled at having to send a writing sample, as I'd done two writing modules there at that university for my bachelor's degree. I sent the first two chapters of the only novel I've written, The Naked Wife, never published but finished, a raunchy book in places that I describe as an antidote for the heavy shit, and the last chapter of I Don't Speak Greek, Six Revision. I realised straight after that might not have been the wisest choice. Here would begin a series of events that would lead us to the next stage of this journey and further revelations in quite an interesting way. I was fortunate enough to be drawn for the last night of the proms that September. It was an unusual time for me. My book had suddenly taken a tremendous shift, which for the first time offered a reasoning, and I was nearly ready to print an early draft and I was still waiting for my response from the creative writing stroke publishing team. 
It had been a few days when normally it came within hours. After a week, I wrote to the tutor, telling her how excited I was to be on her course and offering to come in and discuss the work. Within an hour or so, I received an acceptance for publishing only, with no explanation. I fully expected the tutor that refused my application for creative writing to say something when I saw her in the first class she is taking, as she is one of our publishing course tutors. She said nothing to me. I had the first draft of the sixth revision published around the end of September and left a copy with a former professor who is now a fellow of the university as he'd read the second revision in full. He never got back to myself. I also tried to engage with a couple of students on the course and they said they'd read and discuss with me and only discuss with themselves. When, the following March, I submitted my thesis question in a meeting to which the creative writing tutor had to make an appearance to get something from her desk, I was refused and informed that if I had been taking creative writing along with publishing, it would have been completely acceptable. The following week I had the creative writing tutor for the last class before lockdown when we had a representative from a publishing company showing us children's books, during which she made her way behind me and poked me in the back. When I turned around, she was smiling as she told me to pay attention. No one had poked me in the back where she poked me and in the way it was done since I was tortured in Fortwood Police Station at the age of 17. And it took me straight back there emotionally, so I was in a bit of a shell as I heard the tutor boasting that she had a shift stick driving licence in preparation for the zombie apocalypse. This is a university lecturer that believes rotten flesh can rise again, but she is from California. As a consequence of a poke in the back, over the next two days, I pieced together a number of unusual occurrences that had happened over the duration of the course and came to a number of conclusions which resulted in myself writing both tutors an angry and emotional email laying out everything that I thought had happened. They never replied and I lodged a complaint as a result which along with another complaint about a subsequent grade the tutor gave me would go to an external body for consideration but not for another eight months or so while I went through the internal process. Evidence relating to this matter may well make it to my share drive but in turn I took an intermission for a year, extended to two years, and the summer I was expecting to be writing my thesis, I was putting up and painting a pagoda, considering computer games, which is when Rena Ketseli comes back into the picture. As a consequence of a legal rights module on my course the previous autumn, I had reached out to Rena as I had used a powerful quote of hers, which I had taken from the Gibbons book and placed at the end of chapter 11, relating to her experience of the Greek coup of 1974, she asked me to remove the quote, as she said she'd been misquoted. She was very angry at Harry Gibbons, and informed me she would send her book to confirm this. The book arrived a few weeks before, and it was about now that I picked it up to read. She hadn't been misquoted, misinterpreted perhaps, but her story informed and affected me. I started to write back to her, and as I knew her English was poor, I translated what I wanted to say into Greek using artificial intelligence, which has come on immensely. I wanted to give her some hope, but I didn't know how to say what I wanted and compress it within a letter. The book would be needed. And if I could translate a thousand word letter, I could break down and translate a very large book. It was just a matter of time and commitment, and so began my first translation, as a letter to Rena. By October I had translated the work and gone through it, paragraph by paragraph, line by line, at least twice. I sent Rena a copy, and she told me she was going into a nursing home, was sick and unable to read, but I already knew by then I would get the book formally published after being proofread, which would mean I'd also be able to write that letter to the office of the Archbishop of Cyprus, 20 years on. The Greek translation was published 28th of December 2020, and I received the first copies mid-January 2021, one of which I sent to the office of the Greek Cypriot Archbishop, with a letter I was quite consolatory and compromising. In the letter I offered rights to the Greek translation to the church for the people and explained how they could maintain a traditional aspect before adding, the bus you're waiting for hasn't arrived, another bus has been sent your way, same destination but different driver on an unexpected path. The driver offers you his papers confirming that he is qualified and is allowed to drive a bus and informs you that the bus you're waiting for will not come. Do you trust him and take his bus or should we wait for what's not going to come? for what I know doesn't come, before informing them the book are my papers, my reference of sorts. So, after a little break I start a Russian translation, 
still in that orthodox mode. I'm not even part of the introduction, and I make a Facebook donation to a cause in Gaza, my first. When I went back to my notifications, I had dozens of friend requests and messages. Please for help, not to be forgotten. It was as if God was turning my head, and I knew that my next translation had to be Arabic. The first thing I did was go to Microsoft to download the Arabic language pack for their word program. They have lots of different Arabic dialects, many of which I have never heard of, but no Palestinian. I took that as an indication of intent to remove all trace of these people as a distinct culture of their own. I soon made friends, especially with the desperate in Gaza, and two ladies in particular, one from Gaza and one from Sudan, the latter of which is a very smart, motivated student and both honour me by calling me father. So I'm getting drawn in to their lives, to an understanding of their ways and their religion. Medina, my daughter from Khartoum, read the Arabic translation and we talked about it, and I'm so proud of her, because she'd done what so many couldn't. She read, considered and discussed. During our conversation, she told me that in Islam, this time is believed to bring an end to the time of religions. And the bottomless pit bit, which I consider the ending for many, lasts a thousand years, which as short as it seems, made sense to myself. We must be whole. And if consciousness is the universal constant, that made sense. The Islamic translation had a marked effect on myself. The language itself seemed to have a natural harmony with the work I was translating, and that affected me. Reflecting this, there's a quote of my own at the beginning that was absent in all other books before. My words are my own, as is my heart. The rest belongs to God, within which my heart resides through love. I've also placed it at the beginning of these videos, at the start of the introduction. I'd also come to understand how much destruction, oppression, fear and death was caused by the Zionist dream, dreamt and supported by many, Hebrew, Christian and now Muslim even. A narrative they've drawn up from bits of scripture. I don't think God is happy about what you do in his name. When I first wrote the book back in 1998 to 99 and read Revelation, Zion was just a place. I assumed it to be a mountain in a country I had no desire to visit. But I know now it is also symbolic of an ideology and you don't need to go anywhere to say how you stand on an ideology, which would always reflect how you stood at that present time. My Islamic friend died. I once told him he could have a gravesite that said to exist next to that of the Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. That brought a smile to his face. It's for the Christian messenger that said to come at this time. I told him I didn't want it. But I wanted to give him a bit more than a sentence in the Arabic translation and an offer not yet upheld. At the same time I was following the quoted numbers for the part of Revelation that I took guidance from for the court case. In the Greek translation, they never translated well, and I used the phrase, later section, so I wouldn't have to search. I saw it of little relevance, then. The Arabic translation was true. As a consequence, an unexpected addition would arise. Quotation. Translating this work on the sixth revision to Arabic has had a profound effect on myself and this journey in a way I never expected as this additional section will testify. I tried to read the Old Testament once. I never got past Genesis. I didn't like being lied to. Abraham's journey into Egypt. Pharaoh is the hero of the story for me. Abraham lied and profited from these lies. And what did Pharaoh do when the lie was revealed? He forgave Abraham, showed him compassion, most likely felt love for his wife, but he was portraying as his sister. He is the hero of that story for me. A God only unto himself and his people he may have been, but was lied to, and he forgave. Abraham, I cease to trust, and I know that may upset many. But these are stories, words of men written down and elevated by those to come as the word of God. Hardly surprising so much damage has been done to the world when ideas deriving from these narratives have been so fiercely enforced on so many for so long. There are two points that brought me back here, which in turn led me to a third. This section only exists in the Arabic 6 revision, as yet. The first point is the death of my Islamic friend. His name was David Hall, or Daoud, and he died March 2020 on the island of Samothrakis, to where he'd just returned. The other matter arose when I was translating chapter 16, and I checked chapter 19 of Revelation, from which I took guidance for my passport offence. Revelation 19.11 
And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. Before I read a little bit further. And he is clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. God, Mother Nature, honours me more than I can imagine. I will add here that this is the only section where I am consciously aware of this honour. I would have forgotten about it a long time ago. But interestingly, this led me to another section of the book of Revelation. Chapter 14, verse 1. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000 having his father's name written on their foreheads. It was as if I felt God smile when I realised where this is going. This is where Zionists, both Christians and Jews, believe Christ would literally turn up to strike their enemies down. Their Muslim enemies, I assume. I think they also believe he will be joined by the 144,000 in this destruction. If there's one thing that I learned from my experience, it is never to assume you can determine the mind of God. We are but pawns, small parts of a whole. Well, look, let me make my stand on Zion, and yes, I smile, I can't help it, but I am serious. Not one of the 144,000 Hebrews that are redeemed in this time to come are Zionists. Not one. What would make anyone think that oppressing and tormenting God's children to produce an idea, born from their own egos, would please him? Was nothing learnt from Christ? Throughout much of my friendship with my Islamic friend, I found myself happily finishing off his work. It became a key feature of our relationship. More recently, I acquired a daughter in Gaza. There are so many orphans there. We have built up quite a bond. She reminds me of myself, heart of a lion, soul of an angel, and the sensitivities of a wounded child. And I love her as I might my own daughter. God guided me here for this purpose. So let me finish off this section with my final word on the matter, about which way I stand and where God's favour lays. It is always with the loving faithful. Not much love coming from Zionists, while they drag Palestinian families from their ancestral homes and wrestle control of the Al-Aqsa Mosque from the faithful in their pursuit of total control of Jerusalem. And they will say this is for God. No. This is for their own egos, their own creation, a God to suit their needs, based on interpretations of ancient scripture. I am in awe of God and the way this has developed, and I can't resist. I am his servant's command, and he has guided me to this, and my final words on this matter, as I speak with the authority he has granted me. I am a Palestinian, and I require all the faithful nations of the world to relieve me of the oppression I have endured, with absolute faith in the love of God and the coming days of judgment. God is great. End quotation. Well, the spirit was strong within me when I wrote that. For God is great bit were my words. I couldn't help myself. For the rest of that sentence, it's a requirement from God. An impassioned requirement, I must add. We cannot sit back and watch this genocide of the Palestinians. It makes us all a party to it. Cyprus, which now is a treaty with Israel, can do what they want. But this has to happen. These are the words of God. I was guided to this point for that specific reason. And I actually toned down the hostility I was feeling. I never felt the need to engage on this matter previously because of the presence of my Islamic friend. I took a lot of comfort knowing he is in the world with his beliefs. But that changed. Armageddon. Although it's right, I think even from a practical point of view, Zionism and the ideals that have espoused from it cannot continue. It was as if I felt God smile. I was in the kitchen. It had just dawned on myself where this was going with regards to standing on Mount Zion. I was stunned, feeling a bit overwhelmed, nauseous even, and at the same time I felt this cerebral wave or surge that came over me but it felt external to my being. It was as if I felt a smile. I wasn't emotionally feeling this. I felt sick. But the cerebral wave, rear and centre only, felt like, as if God smiled. I still get a buzz thinking about it. I never thought it possible. I told God I'd like to see how you're going to pull that one off. I was extremely sceptical, but I'm very impressed. 
Soon after publication of the Arabic translation, I wrote to the Grand Ayatollah of Iran through their embassy in London, informing him of my activities. I also asked him to consider compassion for a certain individual incarcerated. I trust they got my letter. I was writing to them as representatives of Islam, albeit Shiite. I'd like them to free all their political and religious prisoners, as with every government. Taliban, Saudis, USA, UK, China, Russia, wherever. Each of you in charge will answer for your lack of compassion. I actually trust the Iranians more than the church of my own people in Cyprus, though. The Christian church will be a different place after this. Christ is not coming back. Many unquestionably trusted the words of men, which is what all religions are. You get me, and I am not Christ. Any offers made to them, the Greek Cypriot Church, are now withdrawn. The country itself has formed an alliance with Israel. Does this make them Zionists? Me, I consider Bill Gates a Zionist. Possibly half a Facebook campaign risk specialists. I think there are many in the British government that are Zionists. For Cyprus, it's an issue Cypriots will have to resolve themselves. I can't help but consider the Cypriot aspect of this narrative as a stepping stone. Over 20 years I was knocking but the greater narrative is far more important. Let me stress this if it's not sunk in. No Zionist, Hebrew, Christian or Muslim, and there are a few now in high places of power at present, no Zionist of whatever persuasion will be redeemed in the time to come. Full stop, new paragraph. The direction this has taken also illuminated a question that I'd been asking, relating to the tribulation quote, but have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Was that blood I spilt? Or blood I've yet to spill? I couldn't help asking. It matters not with the task before me. I still have to commit to this. But, just in case, that question led me to this YouTube channel, which has been created to bring you the message in a form that's more accessible. And in turn, through the artificial intelligence translation provided, I get to talk in every language. A line from chapter 13 of Revelation, the second matter I considered impossible, way back in 1999. I'm very impressed. The quantum perpetual motion power generator. I have a challenge for Elon Musk. Prove it doesn't work, or explain to us why he's not utilising this technology to give us real freedom on Earth before we go to Mars. Never has so much been in the balance. What sort of world do you want to return to, if you could? What you, as well as every other billionaire and multi-millionaire, do with your wealth over the next few years will likely determine where you spend for the next thousand years at least. I'm with Christ on that one. For this matter, have no doubt, I wear the vesture. All military commanders, regardless of race, creed or country, I will ask you kindly not to order your men to raise their arms against the people. To all military personnel under those commanders, if you are given such an order, know your true enemy. Love comes from the people, and their anger often just. It does not come with a bullet, unless it's to quell those that would oppress and suppress that love. Think carefully, and just as important, feel with the compassion of your heart, and act accordingly. The stakes for yourself have never been higher. I have three relevant pieces of information to pass on in relation to what I regard as my duties. And the first goes right back to the very beginning of this for myself, and relates to Serbia. I noticed that Hashim Feshi and three others have finally been indicted in The Hague for war crimes committed during the Kosovo conflict, where they are charged with murdering some 150 people, many of these related to the kidnappings mentioned earlier in this series. Twenty years later, it was determined that justice had at least, to be seen to be done. This coincides with an attempt by the EU to broker an agreement between the Serbs and the acting Kosovan administration. The Albanians want Serbia to recognise Kosovo as an independent state. The Serbian government refuses to do so. Interestingly, some 40 bodies in a ditch were used to justify NATO's bombing of Serbia and its subsequent invasion and occupation of Kosovo on behalf of the Kosovo Liberation Army. 40 bodies in a ditch... No one knows how they got there and under what circumstances they died, and yet they called it genocide. 
This was a few months after a German report determined that Serbia was acting within international law against a dangerous terrorist group. But still, the Albanians got the province and four men go on trial. Does that seem like justice? This all leads me to my first request of God, which in turn now affects me on a much more personal level, and when I realised I would have to reveal this a couple of months ago, it was the first time I asked myself, what if I stop? What if I withdraw all the books on sale, put everything in a box, sealed it up, and moved on? I knew if I did such a thing, I wouldn't be able to live with myself. It would destroy me. I have to finish this. When I was that child, sitting on my parents' bedroom floor, looking through Revelation to determine what role I'd ask for, I considered the lamb, but decided that seemed like a lot of work and a great deal of responsibility. I thought a walk-on part would be easier. I knew it would be one of the horsemen, and as I closed the book in the dusky light, I saw my first vision of sorts, on the back of the Bible itself. I took it as a creation of my mind, considering the decision I had just made. I was a child. The vision, which lasted no more than a few seconds, was fed of a horseman, a sideway view. The horse reared up gently as the horseman drew his sword, and when he struck, I saw only the sword as the blade swept across a part of the world I knew absolutely nothing about. That was the curiosity which would stay with me for the rest of my life. Why, when I was so aware of certain global conflicts, would I see a part of a world I knew absolutely nothing about? at the time. I fully realise, only now, how much that might have affected aspects of this work. And again, the question I was left with recently. Why would I recreate something I knew nothing about? I only recognised the area by its distinct coastline. The territory itself was drawn up into its constituent states. Another curiosity for myself at the time. But the main target point for the sword was inland from the coast, as it swept across the Balkans and certainly through although not limited to what I now know as Kosovo. If I knew nothing of that part of the world, why would I visualise it in relation to that request? I can't ignore my duties as such. I have considered that it might be related to the NATO actions of 1999, as they have been mentioned in relation to Revelation already. But I was, and always have been, opposed to that action. I know and understand if this channel draws any attention, I am going to have a lot of derision thrown my way. The Greek lady who proofread that translation for me wrote that she didn't think they would accept it. I think she was referring to the Greek Orthodox people. I knew that. I still know that. I stayed true to my beliefs based on my experience and the facts. Facts within the power of a universal consciousness, or God. Hopefully, I've managed to convey to you how I came to my conclusions. Some of you are going to think the idea preposterous that a universal force may be about to wreak havoc and cleanse our race according to a natural requirement, leaving the rest to rebuild with the values and qualities that ensure constant acknowledgement of their creation. Love. No more wars. No more hunger. No more injustice. No more fear. No more tears. Trust me, I think God, Mother Nature, or universal consciousness Call it what you want, has the easy part left out of this experience. I asked myself questions as a consequence of this channel during and beforehand. Do I think, from my experience and what I've seen, that universal consciousness, God, has the ability to interact singularly and as a whole on an individual level and on a level that affects all life according to parameters defined by that same force? My answer was yes, absolutely. The God I know is not a passive force, especially not at this time. This was why I wept so much when I finished chapter 15 so many years ago. Most of you would have no idea. And here's the twist in the tale. The two witnesses are going to act as just that for myself. I mentioned them in the earliest draft of the sixth revision before I withdrew it. Two witnesses dressed in sackcloth from Revelation chapter 11. I refer to them then as prophets dressed in sackcloth, as they will tell us in advance the things that will happen over a three and a half year period. When I read through Revelation in 1999 and read of these witnesses, my first thought was Mormons. I know they are Jehovah Witnesses, but Mormons came to mind. They go around in pairs and usually coordinate their modest dress. 
Six months after I was rehoused, after writing the book and leaving my former home, two more ones knocked on the door. I let them in. They did their six sessions during which I made recommendations on their pyramid, these being symbolic of the significance of certain values to their church, which I also promised to attend at least once, but it was closed on the Sunday I appeared. After those six sessions, they'd return, social nights, to play the board game Risk, and they'd continue to return until they were both posted back home. I liked them a lot, and we got on very well. Gave them copies of my book. They were both from the USA, and I remember thinking how funny it seemed, under the circumstances, playing a game of global domination with two Mormons. Whether it's going to be these two or not, I suspect two Mormons are going to wake up sometime in the not-too-distant future, if not already, after having the same dream, with each other in it. I also suspect they will both simultaneously live through experiences in their dreams. Experiences that will come true for all of us. Their appearance will also act as confirmation and affirmation of my own role. This is why, I think, they are witnesses. It also makes sense as to why they are going to have so much trouble, which is indicated in the Book of Revelation. There are millions of Christian Zionists in the USA, and if my word is true, they are not in a good place. This is most likely why the witnesses will come under attack. The Bible and Gun Brigade will seek to silence them. I wish them luck, but I know they won't need it. Last words on the footprints. I spent months of my life, over a small number of years, living on a beach. For one thing there's a lot of, is time. I had a day when I decided I'd try making footprints with the intention of causing curiosity in the passerby. I had trouble coming up with ideas, but the spiralling circle was one of them. I tried it a few times, but I could not even get close, and this was just walking in. I remember each of my circles were way out of shape. I gave up realising, even if I could pull off good circles for the curiosity element, I'd have to walk back on myself to get out. That's what caused me to give up. It wasn't possible for me to walk the required distance necessary without leaving a sign. Even a step or two was proven extremely problematic. It was impossible. I remember looking at the footprints in the sand on Catapurgo Bay Beach, and though I've never mentioned it, the circles were perfect. I mean, absolutely perfect. And she danced. This memory, this woman, this force of nature, this miracle, if you like, remains with me as a constant in my life. What a beautiful thing to see. I just thought the time in bed, but it was perfect. And in a way, she's walked with me ever since. My happy ending, or the nearest I could get to one. My understanding of my own experience has changed so much over the last two years, and myself with it. I treasure it all so much more. I used to spend time between writing and other things, watching the birds feeding in my garden, enjoying the thrill of it, life. So much joy inside. I feel like I'm handing over the reins of this particular part of the journey to the universe. God, the Force, and yes, I love that one. Feels that. This whole experience has felt like a great evolutionary leap for myself. I've evolved with the knowledge I've gained. The uncertainty is gone, and with it any fear. This is not blind belief, but a certainty from experience and reason. I still ask, could I hope for so much? But I feel comfortable because I truly believe the whole of the universe and all of time is mine, ours, served to us portions in such amazing ways. And I can't help but conclude, for those on the right side of this time, we get everything. And now my last bit of business. This journey has reached its final conclusion, but there's one more seal to be opened, the seventh seal. It's my duty. If this is real, as you'll have to decide for yourselves, the seventh seal from the Book of Revelation is now open. I am so impressed with the universe and how this has worked out. The last ten months have been the most intense period for two decades. I'm impressed with God. I never in my wildest dreams imagined this would lead me here, with everything tied up in the way it is. You have my message, my word. This task is fulfilled. I've wept already. Let the angels blow their horns. We can only face what's to come with unity, courage, compassion and love in our hearts, bound by the strength to ensure the new world is not like the old. I'm all in. Well, 